chemiosmosis and oxidative phosphorylation. This is the final stage of aerobic respiration. So by now you should be familiar with glycolysis, the link reaction, and the Krebs cycle. If you're not too familiar with them, uh, restudy them please, or you can also look at the uh, videos that I've made on those particular parts of aerobic respiration. This is uh, sometimes called electron transport chain. You'll see why as we go through this. Um, and a similar process happens in the thylakoid membrane of photosynthesis, but I'm just gonna be dealing with what happens uh, inside the mitochondria uh, with the respiration. Now, talking of which, this takes place on uh, the intermembrane Oh, sorry, the inner membrane, and it deals with the intermembrane space and the matrix. So this is the inner membrane of the mitochondria separating the matrix and the intermembrane space. Now, if you remember on a previous video, we would have talked about uh, the structure of the mitochondria, and there would be some stalked particles. Uh, they're also involved. The stalked particles are enzymes called ATP synthase, uh, and they have a very crucial role in this particular process. Right, so let's have a closer look at the inner mitochondrial membrane. So if we can zoom into the mitochondria, what we may see are lots of phospholipids. Uh, we will see some electron carriers here, which I've uh, done little blue ovals for. These uh, contain um, iron atoms, uh, which means they are perfect for gaining electrons and becoming reduced. Uh, and also then donating that electron on and therefore becoming oxidized again. The uh, little grey object, well the big grey object I've got on the right hand side is representing a stalked particle or an ATP synthase enzyme. So let's look what happens. So uh, during glycolysis, during the link reaction, during Krebs cycle, we have generated an awful lot of reduced NAD and reduced FAD. This is where they come into play now. Because what they're going to do is they are going to release those hydrogen atoms and at the same time these hydrogen atoms split into protons, H+, and electrons, E-. And we generate quite a lot and that's something you can have a work out of how many are generated at another time. So what now? We've got all these electrons and we've got all these protons. Now one thing to note here is that the inner membrane of the mitochondria is impermeable to these protons so they are now stored up inside the matrix but what happens next is this an electron an electron moves from one electron carry to another and the energy releases pulls across a proton into the intermembrane space between the outer and inner membrane now, I'm not being highly accurate here with how many protons are moved according to how many electrons, but just get the idea that as electrons cascade or transport down this chain of electron carriers, energy is released to pull the protons across the inner membrane, the intermembr into the intermembrane space. Let's watch that again. So energy has been released. And this energy is used to pull the protons across the inner membrane to the intermembrane space. What you begin to build up is a proton gradient, or sometimes referred to as chemiosmotic potential. What we've done now, as I said, is we've built up a proton gradient. Note that we still have a lot of electrons inside the matrix. We'll deal with those a bit later. But now we've got these proton gradients, and they're stuck in the uh, intermembrane space, and they cannot go across that inner membrane, but they can flow down the ATP synthase enzyme. This is chemiosmosis. Now, as they do that, it provides an energy source and I was it was described to me it's almost like that the ATP synthase starts to spin round like a generator and in comes ADP and a phosphate and <laughs> sorry about that if you've got headphones on it will happen again so be warned that provides enough energy to phosphorylate 
the ADP and phosphate group into ATP. So that proton force, that proton gradient was enough to phosphorylate ADP and phosphate ADP. Sometimes called a proton motive force. Let's look at that again. Again, I'm not being highly accurate with how many protons flow down to phosphorylate and ATP. But just to give you an idea, here we go. ADP and phosphate. <laughs> ATP. This is called oxidative phosphorylation. Now, you would have come across substrate level phosphorylation before. So let's look at why this is called oxidative phosphorylation now. Look back in the matrix. We still have lots of electrons and we still have lots of protons. So what happens to these now? Because they're just going to build up more and more. What happens is this is where we finally get the use of oxygen. If you remember your basic aerobic respiration equation, glucose plus oxygen. And two protons, two electrons will join to a molecule of oxygen. And what do you make? Water, one of the products in aerobic respiration. If you think about it now, that's the entire aerobic respiration explained. Uh, we looked at CO2 production in the Krebs cycle and link reaction. And now we've got the water production and the use of oxygen. Now, if you used to look at any diagram overall now, you shouldn't be too confused. On the left-hand side, we've got a glycolysis. You can see ATP being used and ATP being produced. You've also got NADH um, or reduced NAD being produced there as well. Uh, the link reaction is not so big clear. There's a big grey arrow at the bottom there. You can see CoA coming off. Uh, it doesn't show the um, reduced NAD being produced though. And then you go into the Krebs cycle with lots of uh, reduction happening and reduced NAD and decarboxylation. And there's a little bit of the diagram of the electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation at the top with ATP synthesis going on.